Okay, welcome to the last one for the day. Um, our next presenter is Andrew Dublay. Uh, sorry, Ashley Dublay. Ashley has been working for numerous financial institutions, global engineering firms, education, and Fortune 500 companies. His presentation is titled The Six Stages of Incident Res Res Response. Please welcome Ashley Dublay. Um, hey, how's it going? I actually didn't think this room would be as busy as it is, so that's pretty cool. Um, so look, incident response is something we all think that we know how to do. We all sort of understand the concepts and stuff, right? But when the incident happens, we don't actually follow our thought pattern. We don't think straight. We don't cover off what we need to do. We lose evidence, all that sort of stuff. So I want to take today out as a bit of a refresher for all of us. Um, just to get us back on track, I've got some resources at the end, so hopefully you know, you can get an incident response plan and all that sort of stuff, take it back to the office and start filling that sort of stuff out and getting something in place. Now, at the beginning of the week, I had the opportunity to sit down with the guys from Ossert. They did a day-long training session on cyber incident response. Um, we all love cyber, right? Scotty loves cyber. Um, but the alarming thing was is at the beginning, we all went around the room and we all talked about what we wanted to get out of it and this, that and the other. But it, it seemed like almost half the room there either didn't have an incident response plan or their incident response plan was absolute crap. Now, I mean, half the room isn't prepared. That's really alarming to me. So, you know, we need to get better at this. So why do we need incident response? You know, why is this such an important thing to us? Um, we all know incidents happen day in, day out, all shapes, all sizes, all colours, different varieties. You know, this isn't a new thing. It's only going to get worse as time goes on. If we're not prepared, it could mean the difference between success and failure of your company. If you've got an internal customer database that gets put on pastebin or something, and you haven't thought about this, and you don't know how to deal with that, that's your reputation gone. You might not come back from that. Likewise, if you're eBay or PayPal or something like that, and all you do is take payments, and you can't take those payments because someone's taking your system down, and you don't react in the right way, you're knackered. You might have other sort of contractual or legal requirements or regulatory requirements. You know, PCI, you might be dealing with health data, all that sort of stuff, where you need to have some sort of incident response plan in there. To get your cyber insurance, you need to show that you have an incident response plan and you followed that. Now, the last little thing there is um, some research CompTIA did. So they went off, they surveyed a bunch of companies, a bunch of different industries and all that sort of stuff. And they came back and they said three and four organisations had suffered some sort of cybersecurity breach. So that's a lot of numbers. 60% of those were categorised as serious. Now, if we go back to what I saw on Monday, we're thinking, you know, half of those people at least haven't got an incident response plan. So already a quarter of those people there are ill-prepared and don't know how to deal with this. The other thing I take away from this is that one in four people don't know where to look for that incident. So good luck to them. So we're going to talk about six stages of incident response. NIST does four. There's other people to do three. But as we heard Thomas talk about this morning, OSET supporting six. You know, SANS, if you do any of their courses on incident handling, they support six. And incident handling as six stages is a bit more granular. It's easier to sort of segregate the information and, and provide that back to your management. So we're going to talk about preparation, what we need to get ready. If you want to dig a hole at home, you don't just go out into the front yard and start digging with your hands. You go outside, you put some sunscreen on, a hat, some gloves, you get a shovel, you get a wheelbarrow, you work out where you're going to put that dirt. Same thing with incident response. We need to know what we're going to do. We need to have all our tools and everything in place. We then move on to the identification phase. Is this an incident or is this just an event? If it's an incident, what's the scope of this incident? How big is it? What's it, you know, what's it reaching to? We then go and talk about our containment phases. Long-term containment, short-term containment. What are we going to do? We're going to pull plugs. We're going to try and patch stuff. From there, we move on to eradication. How do we get the bad guys out? How do we fix this incident? How do we make sure it's not going to come back? Once we've done that, we talk about recovery. When are we going to put these systems back into production and start getting things kicking along again? And then last but not least, we go into lessons learned. 
where we talk about what we did well, what we did crap, you know, what we need, what we haven't got, all that sort of stuff. Then we feed that back into our preparation phase and, you know, wait for the next incident. So we'll spend a bit of time on preparation. There's a lot of stuff to talk about here. Um, people and awareness is really important here. The majority of the incidents that we're going to find out about are from your end users. They're going to report it. Now, if our end users don't know what is acceptable and unacceptable from a security point of view, what looks bad, what looks good, how can they report that to us? How do we know? I mean, we've got lots of systems that tell us this, that, and the other, but it's our end users that are going to see the majority of that stuff. Likewise, in terms of awareness, do they know how to report it? Do they put a help, help desk ticket in? Do they email us? Do they come and see us? Do they call us? What do they do? The next thing we want to look at is our team, our incident response team. We're just security guys. We know about security. We don't know everything about everything. We want our subject matter experts to come along and help us out. We want our database guys. We want our Unix guys, our Windows guys. We want all of them to be able to come and help us out. We want to get them ready and prepared. We want management in there as well. You know, management have a credit card, they can go and get pizza, coffee, coke, all that sort of stuff. They're pretty handy dandy, says the manager up here. Um, the next thing is policy, policy and warning banners. We talked about the people, you know, their awareness and what they, you know, detect. If we don't have policies, we don't know what security looks like. Our policy should say security looks like this box. Everything inside that box we know is secure. Everything outside that box, potentially not secure. Could be an incident waiting to happen. So unless we have that policy there and it sort of describes what security is, the end users don't know. We want to think about our access. It's no good to have an incident on a Friday afternoon and say, crap, we need our database admin. And we call him up and he's not there. He's at the pub. He's had a schooner or two. And we go, OK, crap, let's call his manager. His manager's at the pub buying the beers. And we go, oh, crap, now what? So we call the manager's manager or the director or whoever the hell that is. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't go out drinking, so yeah, you can do whatever you want. But we still don't have the access, so we need to make sure that we can get access to these systems. We might also need access to facilities. It's after hours, you know, we want to send an IR team in, but my swipe card doesn't work on this site. We need to think about that beforehand. Our response plan or our response strategy. Not all of us are going to handle instant response. We might push it off to a third party. We still need a response plan that says that, though. We still need a response plan that tells us the different roles and responsibilities within the organisation. Who should be doing what at what time? Who should be invoking crisis management teams? Who should be going and contacting um, the marketing people, the legal people? Think of your incident response plan as your playbook. It's like when we do DR testing. We have a DR guide. We have like a process that we follow. We all do that once a year. We follow that guide. We know what everyone's going to do and at what point. We need the same thing for incidents. We need to be able to follow a guide and think clearly and know what we're meant to be doing and who's meant to be doing what. We need to think about the tools that we need to use. We might need forensic tools. We might need anti-malware tools. We might need drive duplicators, talons. We might need network switches, network hubs. Think about the stuff that we might need before something bad happens. We want to think about our communication. Once an incident occurs, someone's breached our network, do we feel comfortable using our VoIP phones? Do we feel comfortable using our corporate email systems? Do we want to use mobiles? Do we want to just say, everyone, gather around, we're going to talk about this around a desk? Start thinking about communications back to management as well. We need to alert management that something bad's happening. We'll keep you updated, but just so you're aware. We want to look at space, a war room. If it's a significant incident, it might go for days, weeks, who knows. 
we might need to have a room where we can get everyone in there that people can't see the sensitive information, where we can scribble on walls, scribble on whiteboards, we can talk it out, lock the door at the end of that and then come back later on. We might be running shifts to deal with this incident. We might have a daytime shift and then a nighttime shift comes in. We might need to do handover. Think about having that place ready. It might just be an office somewhere, it might be a conference room, whatever, but you need to be able to kick people out, lock it, keep stuff in there. Think about the documentation you have. If I'm working an incident and I'm looking at a database server and I see funky accounts, I see ports that shouldn't be open in my eyes and I see traffic going around and connecting to systems, unless I have some sort of security architecture document or some documentation that the team has written to tell me what it is, we're not going to know what's normal and what's not. You'll soon find out after your first few incidents that you need more and more documentation to make this happen. And the last one's training. While you have your subject matter experts and they know what they're doing within their role, they might not know how to go and find that information for you when you need it. I need you to interrogate this or find that or whatever. Look for these services, look for these accounts. They might not know how to do that. So make sure they've got adequate training in that. Make sure they have adequate training in the incident response process. So when it all goes pear-shaped, when everyone's all flustered and doesn't know what they're doing, it's just a knee-jerk reaction. It's like our business continuity, our disaster recovery stuff. People that have worked incidents know the value of a jump bag. A jump bag is a bag, a box, or whatever it is, and it just sits somewhere close by to you. An incident happens, and you've got all the stuff you need to handle that. These are some of just the basic things that we should have in that jump bag. So if an incident occurs at midnight, you can go and grab that bag, kick off, and handle stuff. We want to have a journal in there, something that has bound pages and page numbers. When we start working an incident, we want to make as many notes as we can. You can't go back in time and put new notes in there. You've got to do it as you're doing it, as you're collecting the evidence and all that. Bound pages with page numbers, you can take to court. They can see that pages haven't been ripped out. You've got continuity of your notes and all that sort of stuff. It's very important to have that. A call tree or a contact list. You know, the guy's at the pub. His boss is at the pub. His boss is somewhere. You want to know who to call. Do I know a database admin? Do I know a Unix admin? Do I know their manager? Do I know who's on call? Have those numbers, have that thought out. Make sure it's always current and up to date. Whack in some bootable USB sticks or Linux CDs. Make sure you've got tools in there that you need, statically linked binaries. We want to make sure that we've got anti-malware tools, um, you know, forensic tools, anything like that that you can put on them. You have your laptop with other forensic tools, FTK and case, stuff like that. Make sure you've got extra batteries, make sure you've got your chargers, make sure you've got 3G internet connection, 4G internet connection. Google is your friend, it always is. Have your network and computer toolkits, your switches, your cables, your hubs, your network taps, all that sort of stuff. You don't know when you need to go and grab traffic from somewhere or what you need to do. Have your hard drives there, have your SATA cables there, have all that stuff there. Have some drive, drive duplicators or write blockers. A lot of our forensics tools will do network acquisition, but there's going to be the odd case where you can't do a snapshot, you can't do network acquisition. You have to just duplicate the drive. Use a drive blocker. You can't stuff the original evidence up. So we've got all our preparation done and we're, you know, someone's come up and said, look, bad stuff's happening, help. We need to work out what's an, you know, an event and what's an incident. So NIST awesomely says, an incident is the act of violating an explicit or implied security policy. That's super vague. We've got policies, but you know, that could mean anything. US CERT then come and put some examples in there. So attempts either failed or successful to gain unauthor unauthorized access to a system or its data. So that one's fair enough. Um, an unwanted disruption or denial of service, which is fair enough as well. Um, the unauthorised use of a system for the processing or storage of data. So if someone's put a World of Warcraft server in our data centre. 
changes to system hardware, firmware, or software characteristics without the owner's knowledge, instruction, or consent. So we start getting an idea of what could be an incident here. It could be many things, you know, it, it might be other than this, it could be anything. I like to think of it as, has there been a significant deviation from our normal operations, and does it have the appropriate scope to be an incident? So, you know, we, we send usually, you know, 50 emails a minute, all of a sudden we're sending 500 emails a minute. You know, all those emails are going to somewhere .ru or whatever, or to Gmail accounts. Do we think that's an event or an incident? To fully determine it, we want to go and have a look at some of our logs. We've all got these whiz-bang tools that give us log files and all this, that, and the other. Start looking at them. System logs, error logs, DLP logs, AV logs, you know, firewall logs, all that sort of jazz. Start putting all that data together, having a look at what's going in and out, and determining if it's bad. If we determine it's an incident, start reporting on it. The sooner we report on it, the sooner we can get our incident response team together, the sooner we can start thinking about the next coming stages. As soon as we have our incident response team together and they know what's going on, we start the communications with management. Mr. CTO, this is bad stuff's happening. We're working on it. We'll come and talk to you in about two hours to let you know. But if someone calls, you're on top of things. All in, only has to be like that at the very beginning. If it's an incident, as soon as we determine it's an incident or think it's an incident, document absolutely everything in sight. You can never document too much in an incident. There's been many times where I've worked on an incident with other teams and we've, someone's done documentation, someone hasn't, they've made notes, they haven't made notes, and we always find a hole there where we wish we knew something but we didn't write it down. We think we know what we did but we can't quite remember because we did so much stuff. Always document the who, what, where, when and how. We don't know who we're going to have to provide this to. Might have to go to police, might have to go to court, might have to go to a third party, and might just have to stay internal. But unless we have that, we don't know. So document that as much as we can. If possible, have two incident handlers. I say that because in the early stages of an incident, there's a lot happening. We're trying to determine what's causing this issue. We're trying to determine how we're going to stop it, what the extent is, all that sort of stuff. You're going to have one incident handler that's going to just be looking at stuff. Is this useful? Is this useful? Is this rubbish? Is this just noise? Whatever. The first thing I said there is we want to start documenting everything. We want to start collecting all this in a constructive manner. We want to document how we're collecting this evidence and what we're doing with it. Your first person can then go and say, I need this, 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 and this collected. The second person can then come in with a cool head, calm, collected, start gathering that evidence and documenting how they've gathered that evidence. Once they've gathered that evidence, they can start establishing the chain of custody. Chain of custody is really important. It says who had access to this data at what time, when, and who they passed it on to. Everyone's signing it. Everyone's aware of it. We need to fill these chain of custody forms out if we want to go and take this to the police, to the court, or whoever. Once we determine the full scope and we start doing that, we can start moving on to our next phases. Maybe. So we want to move on to containment. We want to limit or prevent any further damage from occurring. We want to stop all the bad stuff. We've got a denial of service. We've got all our customer database leaking out somewhere, all this sort of jazz. We want to stop that. In certain cases, we want to allow that to continue for some time. We might want to gather better evidence. A lot of people will let this stuff go on so they can get better logs, better evidence, and try and go for attribution. I think now if we start talking to the people like, you know, I think the FBI's changed their mind, Mangin, all those guys, attribution's hard. And if we do know who did this, you know, it's going to be China, Russia, Syria, whoever. We don't really have the jurisdiction. Is it worth the effort? Do you want to get your payment gateway back online or do you want to work out who's doing this and why? It's a business decision that you have to make. I can't make that for you. We've got a few factors that we need to think about in when we work out what our containment strategy is going to be. We need to work out what the potential damage or theft of the resources is going to be. 
do we want to do a short-term containment, long-term containment, whatever? If it's bad enough, we might want to just pull the system offline. What are our requirements for evidence collection? Do we need to allow this to go on for quite some time so we can gather more evidence? Our service availability. I'm PayPal. I can't take payments. Crap. Time and resources required to implement the containment strategy. It might be New Year's Day. All our staff are drunk, hungover, looking for bacon. We can't do anything. You know, it might be easy to just pull the plug. How effective is our containment strategy going to be? You know, are we going to just remove the odd account, shut down a service, put on a patch, fingers crossed, it's going to rock? We don't know. And how long do we want this containment strategy to go on for? So before we start diddling with any of these systems, we want to start taking forensic images. Use known good forensic tools. Use your FTKs, your end cases. Worst comes to worst, start using DD, whatever you need to do. One of the important things here is when you make these images, you make your image, you get your hash of your file, make sure the image is sound and not corrupt. I've worked on so many cases where we've had our young guys come in and do all the imaging for us, and when we go to process it at the end of the day, the images are stuffed, and we can't do anything with it. Make sure they work. Do the validation. It's an easy thing to do. So we start thinking, do we want to do some short-term containment, some long-term containment, something in between? Short-term, we're just going to pull the system offline. We just need to do something quick now. We'll only do it, we'll bring up another server, we'll patch it, we'll do whatever we need to do, but let's just get this fixed for now. Longer-term strategies, you know, we might put temporary fixes in there. We might remove accounts, disable services, firewall rules, patch, who knows? We need to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. But at the end of that, we've contained it. We're not having any more issues. We've stopped the bad guys from doing bad stuff, you know, sure we might have stuff on pastebin or whatever, but, you know, we're stopping it from, from continuing on. We move on to eradication. We want to get rid of all the bad. Now, my first point here is around ensuring that proper measures have been taken to clean the system up. You're a brave, brave person if you think you can clean a system up. If somebody has hosed one of your systems, do you know what they've done? You might get rid of all the accounts, you might get rid of all the files and think you've done it, but how do you know they don't have a back door that will open up to port knocking? We knock on certain ports at certain times in certain order. Ooh, there we go, back door. How do we know we don't have root kits in there? The best way to go about it is just to re-image the system. Use known good media or use good known backups. The backup part is the hardest. Because we saw something happen today, we don't know when it happened originally. We don't know the start. I think the average time is like three to four months for detection. If you can't validate in that three to four months or before, you don't know if it's clean. You don't know if it's good. It might not be a viable backup four months old as well. So we do a re-image, and then we start looking at improving our defences. What caused the issue in the first place? Lazy patching, no AV, you know, we left some ports open, um, firewall rules, whatever. Start improving our defences. Don't let it happen again. Then we want to start putting this stuff back into production. We need to really think hard here how we're going to test a system to make sure it's ready to go back into production. How do we know the system has been successfully rebuilt? How do we know it's fully functioning? How do we know it's clean? Do we have the right tools to test that? Can we monitor it? Can we validate it? How long are we going to monitor the system once it's back into production to make sure it's not getting hammered again or make sure it's not you know, misbehaving or something. We work that out with the system owners, we work that out with our cert team, 
we determine what we're going to do here. Then together with the system owner, we decide when we're going to put this all back into production. When is the best time? When have we got people there to watch it? When have we got people there that know what's going on, that can see if anything bad is happening? Have we got guys on the firewall looking at stuff? Have we got IPS guys there? So we successfully recover our system. We put it back into production. Everyone's happy. There's lots of high fives. We go into our lessons learned. To me, this is the most critical phase because a lot of stuff happens in an incident and every incident is different. You're never going to get the same incident. So this is where we learn from what we've done. This is where we make ourselves better. If you started any documentation as a part of the incident, finish it off now. Management have made sure that you've got all your staff together as an incident response team. Use that while you can. In two, three weeks' time, they're going to be back on operational tasks and they're not going to do any of the other documentation for you. Get it done while everyone's there, while there's a bit of enthusiasm from everyone. Get your system documentation done, any IR documentation done, processes changed, um, any emergency cab stuff that you might not have put in. You might have just bypassed a few systems and been agile. Do all that stuff, right? Then we want to start creating our formal report. We want to give a report to all the stakeholders involved in the incident. So we want to cover the who, what, where, when, and how of the incident. We make that report, we give it out, and then we organise to have a couple of lesson learned meetings. I would have at least two, one with our IR team and one with our management team. They're going to be pitched at different levels. We're going to cover the same stuff off, but the IR team will probably be of a more technical nature, and our management will want to know why it happened, how it happened, you know, who do I point a finger at? So we have a presentation. We cover who detected the initial problem and when they detected it. What the scope of the initial incident was. What did it affect? How many systems? Just because we hit a web server, it doesn't mean it didn't affect database servers, single sign-on servers, et cetera, et cetera. How do we contain and eradicate the issue? What work did our, our IR team do to fix this? Was the CSERT team effective? Did they do a good job? Did they get on it? Was there places where we could do, you know, could have done better? Other things that we just shouldn't have done? We need to really have a good hard long look at that. And then put aside some really good quality time to sit down with the teams, both management and, and technical, and get their comments, get their feedback, get their suggestions. We might have worked this incident and then gone, you know what, we couldn't turn the air conditioning on, it was hot as hell, or there was no coffee, you know, or, you know, we did these three processes and we could have done that in one go. There's a lot of that there. And as we go through and do more and more of these, we can streamline those processes and do a better job. So we get all the information from this lessons learned and from the process that we've just followed and we feed that back into our preparation phase. Do we need to make new documents? Do we need to have new processes? All that sort of jazz. And with that, we have successfully completed our incident. So I've got some resources here for you guys. Um, an incident handler's handbook from SANS. It's got some really good info there on, um, you know, basic incident handling, what people need to do. Um, I'll have all these slides. I'll put them on LinkedIn and stuff like that and post them. I'm sure Rosset will do the same. So everyone that's taking photos, you can keep taking them if you want, but I'll give them to you. Um, or you can come and see me afterwards and I'll give them to you. Um, NIST um, special paper 800-61 Rev 2. So that's NIST's version of this. They go for a four-stage approach. Um, horses for courses, whatever. Um, all the ISO stuff. Uh, chain of custody form, if you don't have one, don't know what it looks like, there's one there. Um, a SANS forensics cheat sheet, so if you're doing command line uh, disduplication and all that sort of stuff, uh, there's some cool resources there. Uh, Lenny Zelter has a really cool um, security incident survey cheat sheet where you can actually go to uh, your system owners and ask them a string of questions to get a bit more info out of them because, you know, talking to system owners, they didn't do anything bad. Um, and there's also a couple of like command line stuff that you can do there. 
Um, seven deadly sins of incident response, so how you can really hose your incident response capabilities and do the wrong thing. It's always good for a laugh. Um, incident handling forms, an example incident response plan for people that don't have one. Use this as a bit of a template. Make it pretty and look like your company. Um, the ASD information security manual and some CSERT sample policies. With that, thank you very much. If you want any questions, yell them out. <laughs> Come Darren, we'll go with you first. So uh, a while ago, a couple of Mandy guys, uh, forensic, sorry, I'll sort of speak up. Uh, Mandy and forensics guys said that generally when they walk in, when they're called in after a breach, the first thing they do is kick the security team out. Yep. Uh, so they don't want, and so I wonder, if, if, what do you think of that? Like in terms of, if you were to follow this to a team, are you going to be more likely to work alongside them? I don't know. I mean, it depends on capabilities within the team. So just because you've got an incident response capability doesn't mean it's a really good one. You need to know when you need the external people to come in. And, you know, talking to Thomas at the beginning of the week, he was saying, you know, I also come into a lot of incidents and the security guys are just running around circles, they don't know what they're doing, and it's more of a hindrance than a help. A lot of people think, I'll give you all this information, it'll be of a help, but it's totally useless. So sometimes, and I understand, I've, when I worked at one of the Fortune 50s, we had... Mandy didn't do the exact same thing to us. And for me, as a staff member for that company that was in the CERT team, it felt pretty degrading. But at the end of the day, the importance of that incident and what those guys came in and did overshadowed that. So I think sometimes you've got to sort of, you know, swallow your pride and let some of that stuff happen. Because they have their own processes. And if we're going to engage them for a very specific reason, and, and there would be a specific reason why we go in Mandiant, we want them to follow their processes and not try and cloud the matter and stuff it up. Anyone else? Oh, I thought we were all going for beers. Oh. <laughs> no, I'll ask you anyway. Um, obviously, doing that in its full um, version is, is a large scale exercise for a large organisation. How can you scale that? Yeah, look, and I think smaller, smaller organisations, and, and look, I've worked for lots of companies, so I've worked for, you know, the little small software development houses where we've needed something like this. And this is where we need to leverage these third parties, you know. We need to have that plan so we know who's responsible, what we need to do, but we, know, we need to know when we need to hand that off to more experienced people. The smaller companies, you have men of many hats, you know. You might be the network guy, you might be the security guy, you might be the Windows guy doesn't mean you can do incident response as well, you know. Um, while the incident's happening, you've still got to do your operational tasks. You've got to keep the lights on. So I think it's about having that juggling act, you know, knowing when to hand off to somebody else, having that documented, having that, you know, a retainer in place for someone. You know, use your mandates, use your auscerts, whoever. I don't care, you know. I think it's about realising what your capabilities are. It's better to say our capabilities are down here and we can't do it then say our capabilities are up here and not being able to do that because that's just tears waiting to happen. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Just a quick one. Uh, from the professional standpoint, uh, what are your uh, key recommendations to handle the, for instance, a zero day attack or very cyber security and zero response standpoint? I think we're going to follow the same process. You need to look at your, you know, what your business does. Um, and what its key functions are. So depending on what the zero day attack is, what it's attacking, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just attacking a system, your zero day. You just still need to have those processes when it happens to know how to deal with that. I don't think there's anything I can say from an incident response point of view that you should do this to stop that. Does that answer your question? Not really. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, if you've got your SIEM and all that sort of stuff, you can put your intel, your threat feeds in there. You can start doing threat modelling and things like that to work out, you know, where your holes are and what you should be looking at. Um, that's a start, you know, just a part of everyday operational security in my eyes. It's not a part of incident response. There's certain things that we should be looking for, you know, and, you know, you're talking about your SOCs, your SIEMs and all that sort of stuff, and you should be able to get enough information from that traffic 
over time to know this is my baseline when you can start seeing things that stick out. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> suck. <laughs> it's, it's quite a co comprehensive guide and, and probably can be something of an IR Bible, but how common do you think really good IR is? Oh, I don't think it's very good at all. What, what, what about within a reasonably resourced... I, I think that's the key thing there, is reasonably resourced. So everywhere I've worked, the Fortune 50 manufacturing company, which had... 275,000 users, lots and lots of IR people, security people. We did a good job of it. Okay. But we also had Mandiant people, Semantic people and stuff like that to help us get to that point. Every other place I've worked, especially Australian-based companies that don't have that resource, it's a best effort. So if you were to look, say, maybe if you were to take sort of Fortune... X. Never, I think what it is, is it, it's the companies that value security and value, you know, can put a budget to security. You know, and it's not always about just the IR. It's about all the other work that we do operationally to be able to detect that and know that in the first place. You know, like if we can't detect it, we, how do you do IR? So I think it's about a company being of a set size with a set budget and understanding what security actually means to them. You know, your local fish and chip shop's not going to do this. You know, Red Rooster won't do this. But, you know, Telstra will do this, Rio Tinto will do this. Do you know what I mean? I would hope government do this. I'm not going to incriminate myself any further, bastard. <laughs> Anything else? Beers, 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 beers! Woo! <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>